Tell me if you recognize this song. So that song, called Mars the Bringer of War, is the first of the seven movements in Gustav Holst's orchestral suite, The Planets, which has been used or referenced so often in movies, music, TV, and video games that its cultural influence has its own Wikipedia page. It doesn't take an expert in classical music to know that The Planets is kind of a big deal, just like it doesn't take an expert in astrophysics to know that there's definitely not seven of them. In symphonic order, we have Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and ignoring the sequence there, we have have two interesting gaps. The first notable omission is Earth, which Holst didn't include because he was inspired by astrology to write his symphony, and as far as he was concerned, Earth had no astrological significance. My deepest condolences to the astrophysicists out there, but astrology has inspired timeless works of art and therefore might have already done a little more for humanity than your discovery of the first Earth-like planet around an M-dwarf star discovered by the transit method on a Tuesday. You gotta be the first at something. The second absence is everybody's favorite outer solar system object formerly known as a planet Pluto. But in this case, the oversight was less intentional. Holtz had finished writing the planets in 1917, and Pluto wasn't discovered until 1930, only four years before his death. In the decades since Pluto's discovery, there were many attempts to complete the planets, the most notable of which is probably Colin Matthews' 2000 composition, Pluto the Renewer. Though he had his reservations, such as the musical completeness of the original suite, Matthews wrote his attempt at Pluto and in 2006 hit a milestone that most contemporary composers can only dream of. A recording and performance by the Berlin Philharmonic, one of the world's premier orchestras. Almost a century after Holt started this work, this now scientifically complete and fully artistically realized recording was set to be introduced to American audiences with a CD release on on September 12th, 2006. And not three weeks earlier, the International Astronomical Union's General Assembly voted on a new definition of the word planet and in doing so revoked Pluto of that title. Can you imagine? Your symphony, your literal magnum opus, inevitably years in the making, finally reaches the highest stage only three weeks after the gimmick it's premised on is killed off on a technicality. The drama. If that happened to you, you would have every right to be upset with the new definition. I would completely understand your feelings. However, if you are not English composer Colin Matthews and you are outraged at Pluto's demotion from its planetary status, in my professional astronomical opinion, I do think you're being kind of ridiculous. But to put your probably ridiculous feelings into their proper context, the astronomers responsible for the whole Pluto thing were maybe being kind of ridiculous too. So let's talk about it. <laughs> Pluto is a dog that exists in a universe that for some reason has other dogs that are more human looking and can talk. Pluto is the only Sailor Scout I could pull off cosplaying in an alternate universe where I was into that sort of thing. Pluto is an astronomical object in the outer solar system that people have really strong feelings about. A few videos ago, I mentioned that I used to study Pluto and made a joke that Pluto is better off not a planet. And viewers had opinions. So in this video, I wanna to get to the bottom of this whole Pluto thing once and for all. We'll start off by looking at the science. What is Pluto? What is planet? Is Pluto planet? Then, because it's me, we're gonna get into the tea. What's the personal story behind the people who demoted Pluto? And to conclude, we're gonna dig into that outrage. Why do people care so goddamn much? No central thesis today, just me going off with my Pluto hot takes. Go ahead, leave a comment about how I don't even have a central argument, you insipid, uncurious, pseudo intellectual Pluto was discovered by a 23 year old whose job it was to look at two pictures of the same bit of sky, see if anything changed, and then repeat that until he found something. He was the 1930s version of numpy.diff. When Pluto was discovered in 1930, it was immediately accepted as a planet because of course it was. It was the 1930s. Scientists believe a lot of wild things back then. By that time, the categorization of planet hadn't really changed that much since antiquity, when ancient Greek astronomers used the term asteris planetae, or wandering stars, 
to describe the bright star-like objects that would move across the night sky, unlike the fixed stars that didn't move relative to each other. At some point, this Polish tryhard named Copernicus figured out that these wanderers didn't orbit the Earth, but instead orbited the Sun along with the Earth. But until the 20th century, the basic premise of a planet was pretty straightforward. It's a big bright thing that orbits the Sun. Sure, comets and asteroids kind of muddied the waters a little bit, and the exoplanets we've been learning about in the past few decades obviously orbit other stars and not the Sun. But as usual, we are simplifying. This is not graduate level planetary science, this is YouTube. We are here for the vibes, not the rigor. The vibes are immaculate, but the rigor is just adequate. But right off the bat, Pluto wasn't like the other planets. She didn't wear makeup or chase boys, and all she ate was tacos, pizza, and chicken nuggets. Childhood me feels so attacked by not like other girls' content. Seriously though, there were certain trends in the other solar system planets that Pluto never seemed to fit. Here's a list of them. Number one, it doesn't fit either group. So excluding Pluto for now, we have two groups of planets in our solar system. The inner terrestrial planets, small, rocky objects orbiting relatively close into the sun, and the outer Jovian planets, much larger and much more massive gas giants orbiting at a greater distance. But while Pluto has a composition and structure kind of similar to the inner planets, it's small and rocky at least, it's so far out in the furthest reaches of the solar system, even past the gas giants that all its non-rock components can't exist as liquid or gas, but only ice. Pluto is kind of its own genre of planet. It's a genre. Number two, its orbit is really weird. Planets in our solar system generally orbit in circles on the same plane. That means that if you looked at the solar system face on, you'd see everything moving in circles, but if you looked at it edge on, you'd see everything moving back and forth along the same line. Our little weirdo Pluto, however, has this massively stretched out and tilted orbit relative to the rest of the planets. Its orbit is so weird and elongated that it actually weaves in and out of Neptune's orbit. Fun fact, from 1979 to 1999, Pluto was closer into the sun than Neptune. Number three, it's tiny. It's just extremely tiny. Pluto's literally half the size of the moon. The moon? That moon? Half? Absolutely not. Number four, there are other Plutos. So in the 90s, people started discovering more things like Pluto. Similar size, similar composition, similar location, similar weird orbits that would eventually become known as dwarf planets. Turns out there's kind of a lot of them. Depending on who you ask, there are 10-ish of these baby planets orbiting our sun, which means if Pluto's a planet, we're gonna have a lot more planets on our hands. What's the acronym gonna be then, huh? My very educated mother just served us nine pizzas because she heard eating mostly quiche gets old. Quiche never gets old, that's ridiculous. And Pluto's not even the first or biggest dwarf planet. Respectively, those would be Ceres, which was discovered over 100 years earlier, but was initially thought of as an asteroid, so it kind of had the opposite categorization trajectory as Pluto. And Eris, which clocks in at 0.002 eight Earth masses relative to Pluto 0.0022. It was actually the discovery of this slightly bigger planet Ares that pushed the IAU to define what they mean when they say a planet. Glossing over the decision-making process and all the iterations of definitions and any critiques thereof, the final definition they voted on had three criteria. In our solar system, a planet is a celestial body that one, is in orbit around the sun, two, has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, a nearly round shape, and three, has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. There's a lot of jargon there, so let's translate this a bit. Criteria one is pretty straightforward. It orbits the sun. Everything in our solar system orbits the sun. This one didn't really need an explanation, did it? Criteria two is a little more interesting. Has sufficient mass to assume hydrostatic equilibrium, a nearly round shape. This basically means that an object has enough mass to gravity itself into a sphere. If you haven't noticed, a lot of the really big things in the universe are spheres, and this is because gravity is a spherically symmetric force. It pulls equally from all directions into a center. Why the rest of the really big things in the universe are disks instead of spheres is a conversation for another day. A good way to build intuition for what this spherically symmetric criteria is saying is to consider the things that aren't spheres. There are lots of asteroids, and also most things on Earth that we interact with, that have decidedly non-spherical shapes, and this is because their internal structure has forces greater than that of gravity. Not a sphere, not a sphere, not a sphere. Maybe a sphere, I don't know. But if you get big enough, at some point gravity takes over. It's like, <laughs> that's the technical term. <laughs> but as you may be aware, Pluto is a sphere, so we're still fine. But now we get to the criteria that does it in. Has cleared the neighborhood. This is where a 
planet planet, so to speak, diverges from a dwarf planet. A planet planet is gravitationally dominant in its immediate vicinity. Anything around the planet, like moons or the debris that forms rings, orbits the planet because it's so much more massive than anything else around. But Pluto, what can I say? She's complicated. The first complicating factor is Sharon. No, not Sharon from your HR at work. Sharon, the companion object of Pluto that was discovered in 1978 when somebody noticed that sometimes Pluto's got a bump on it. Historically, Sharon was understood to be a moon of Pluto, but the complicating twist we found out later is that Sharon doesn't actually orbit Pluto. Pluto and Sharon orbit each other. To understand this, let's think about the sun for a second. We generally think of the sun as the center of the solar system, but it's not technically, or at least not exactly. The solar system's Barry center, or the hypothetical center of mass point that all objects in the system orbit, is often right outside the surface of the sun. And I say often because it's constantly moving. Every new configuration of all the objects in the solar system as they move along their individual trajectories defines a new center of mass. So for the solar system, the Barry Center ends up spiraling in and out of the surface of the sun on the scale of only tens of years. Can somebody tell me what astrological state the Barry Center of the solar system being in or out of the sun would bring about? It's gotta be something binary like cat person in, dog person out. I don't know, I just like coming up with fake astrology stuff using new space knowledge because then I get to troll the astrophysicists and the astrologers in one go. Apparently I don't like anybody. So the Barry Center of the solar system is nearly the center of the sun. The Barry Center of the earth and the moon is nearly the center of the earth. The Barry Center of Jupiter and its whole mess of satellites is nearly in the center of Jupiter. But the Barry Center of Pluto? It's not even in Pluto. Ever. That's what complicates the whole Sharon is a moon of Pluto thing. Sharon doesn't orbit Pluto, Pluto and Sharon orbit each other in a binary system. Sure, the Barry Center is a lot closer to Pluto. Pluto's more massive than Sharon is, so to balance the system, Sharon orbits at a greater distance. Kind of like how if you had two different weights on a lever of some sort, you'd have to put the lighter one farther out to balance the heavier one closer in. But yeah, Sharon's not a moon. If anything, Pluto and Sharon are a binary dwarf planet system. But it gets even more complicated. As of 2005, the Pluto-Sharon binary system has moons. As in, Pluto and Sharon are this little spiral with four or other objects circling them both. The objects are, in order of discovery, Nix, Hydra, Kerberos, and Styx. Fun story, one of my favorite college astro professors actually discovered the latter two of those. And Doug, if you're watching this, just wanna say I have yet to see an educator commit to the bit as hard as you and Cole did with that whole orbital dynamics juggling superhero stunt. Truly an inspiration. But it was actually really cool working with him around that time because I got to see how objects get named. It turns out that the solar system has very strict naming schemes set by the IAU, and even if you discover something, you have to follow their rules for naming it. I know, I was also really disappointed to find out that you can't name the things you find whatever you want. So for example, Jupiter, which is the Roman name for Zeus, has 80 moons named after the many, many paramours of the mythic king of gods. A lot of them are actually like Greco-Roman mythology based. Saturn is Titans, Neptune is water deities. I guess Uranus has Shakespeare characters, which is kind of different, but then we're right back to the classical myths with Pluto. Though I do think that it has the coolest twist, the underworld. So Pluto is Roman Hades, the god of the world of the dead, which is guarded by Kerberos and separated from the world of the living by the river Styx. And Sharon's the one that rows you across the river. And Nyx is Sharon's mom and also the goddess of the night. And Hydra is also a monster. They kind of phoned it in with that last one, huh? And there's honestly even more levels to this whole naming thing, but this is such an unnecessary tangent. Point is, we have all these outer moons that make Sharon look like even less of a moon, which makes Pluto look a lot less like a planet and more like a binary dwarf planet system with several moons. And if that wasn't complicated enough, there's also this like big cloud of dust around all of it. Like some planets have rings. Actually, side fact, did you know that it's not just Saturn that has rings? Jupiter's got some rings. I don't know about Neptune off the top of my head. I know Uranus has got some rings. A couple of my friends are actually working on a paper right now about about Uranus's rings and they'd better take this opportunity to name the paper something hilarious. You can't troll with planet names, but you can troll with paper titles. But yeah, some planets have debris that they shepherd into rings, but Pluto just has this amorphous blob of floating dust. And I know dust doesn't sound like a lot, because you're thinking just like Earth dust, pretty harmless, but this particular cloud of dust almost screwed over a NASA mission a couple years back. For those who aren't familiar, New Horizons is a space probe that was designed to fly by Pluto and launched in 2006. Ironic, right? 
you finally launch your big billion dollar mission only for your science target to be categorically demoted only a few months later. The New Horizons guys might be the only people besides that composer from the beginning of the video who have a right to be upset about Pluto. But there was this whole problem where when New Horizons was launched, people hadn't learned about the dust yet. And since it wasn't taken into the design of the probe, there was concern that it would cause serious damage during the flyby. Astronomical instruments are pretty delicate and things in space move very fast. Not a great combo. So in the months leading up to the flyby, there was this big effort to simulate the impact of the dust on the probe so that they could navigate it safely through the cloud while still getting as much data as possible. This is the work that I mentioned being a part of a few videos ago when I was talking about Pluto. And in the end, it was fine. The Pluto flyby was successfully completed in 2015 and we got that iconic picture of Pluto with a heart on it. But the takeaway here is that this dust cloud is not an insignificant feature of the system. And in particular, this dust, along with all the moon and non-moon objects flying around, really make it seem like Pluto hasn't cleared out its neighborhood. Remember the planet definition we were talking about? The third point, planets have to clear out their neighborhood. All that dust is there because Pluto and its entourage literally aren't planet enough to hold on to their surfaces. Anytime something hits them, the dust just flies into space and hangs around. Not a ring, not an atmosphere, but a cosmic dust bunny, <laughs> as my friend so aptly put it. So where were we? I feel like I'm like seven tangents into this. What's that French expression about herding goats? My point is, there is a lot going on in Pluto's neighborhood. A whole block party, really. So it fails the IAU's final criteria for planethood. Planets are things that clear out their orbits. Pluto has not done so. Ergo, Pluto, not planet. And contrary to popular opinion, I don't think that's a bad thing. Isn't it kind of cooler this way? Like, it could have just been this cold rock way out there with some boring moon like an Earth knockoff, but instead, it's this dynamic, complex, multi-moon shrouded in a cloud of dust thing and that's just more interesting isn't it for this new definition of planet to include pluto it would have to lack some of this weird uniqueness that makes it one of my favorite objects in the solar system and after all even with all these scientific reasons the word planet in this context is ultimately just a category some astronomers made up. Just a taxonomical term that some people will use that is just as arbitrary as the Greeks' original definition for their wanderers. The insistence of identifying the true and objective definition of a word that we made up is kind of silly. They're just words. Even in science, they're just words. Did you know that astronomers call everything that's not hydrogen or helium a metal? Like within astronomy, it is definitionally accurate to call, for example, oxygen, the stuff that you're probably in the process of inhaling right now, a metal. You're breathing metal. Astronomy says so. It's science. <laughs> so my real point here is that even though Pluto's clearly not a planet, a planet is kind of a made up thing. I'm not saying that Jupiter and Mars don't exist. You can go outside and see them yourself most most nights, what I'm saying is that the official scientific astronomical term planet that used to include Pluto but no longer does is made up. On the one hand, we have nature, which is just a thing that exists, and on the other hand, we have science, which is a thing people do. They're related, but they're not the same. But here's the thing about things we make up. There are many possible ways we can make them up. There are infinite ways we could have defined a planet. The IAU could have, like, not included the clear your neighborhood rule, or defined that rule to exclude anything with rings, or they could have just kept the original nine planets as a historical term and made up a different word for everything else or literally anything else they wanted. It's astronomy, there are no consequences. <laughs> and this infinite possibility means that the way they did define a planet must mean something. There must be reasons we defined it this way at this time in these circumstances instead of that way at that time with those circumstances. So why did we define it this way? Or maybe who convinced us to? So according to Wikipedia, the biggest pushers of the updated definition that nixed Pluto were Neil deGrasse Tyson, Steve Soder, and Mike Brown. Neil wrote a whole book about the demotion, but I'm not gonna get into him today because I'm working on a whole other video about him. And from my time working in astronomy, I personally don't really see him and Soder as like the big drivers of the change. That impression is based largely off the fact that astronomy is a small field and people talk, so I have something of an unofficial, unsightable perspective 
in my pocket. But looking at all these people's careers since the decision, it seems to me that there was really only one person whose work had a stake in the vote. And that was Mike Brown. Just to be clear, this is not a Mike Brown hit piece. Please don't go cancel Mike Brown. I just think his story is interesting and provides some perspective as to how things like definitions or discoveries come about. So Mike Brown is an American astronomer known as the man who killed Pluto, which to me feels very like that thing where somebody tries to make up their own nickname. Like that guy who whenever he meets somebody new is like, yeah, my name's Mike, but people call me the man who killed Pluto. So if you just want to get that going, <laughs> I mean, I guess that's what you're doing when you write a book and title it, How I Killed Pluto. It's not exactly subtle, but he's actually done a lot more for solar system astronomy than just murder childhood favorite celestial bodies in cold dust. And some of it's actually pretty interesting. I'm gonna tell you about three objects Mike Brown discovered over the course of his career, starting with the one that took down Pluto. So the first one is Eris, which we mentioned earlier. Remember the other dwarf planet that's a little bit more massive than Pluto is? Brown discovered Eris in 2003, and NASA quickly reported it in the media as the 10th planet. I actually have vague memories of reading about that in like third grade and wondering whatever happened to it and why I never heard about the 10th planet again. And despite doing a PhD in astrophysics, it's only in researching this video that I learned what happened to it. So what happened to third grade me's planet 10? Like I said earlier, Eris challenged the definition of planet by being bigger than Pluto. Current knowledge says Eris is more massive than Pluto, not bigger. Those are two different things, mass versus size. But at the time they did think it was bigger. So the idea was that if Pluto was a planet, and Eris was bigger than Pluto, then Eris must be a planet. So astronomers were like, well, we're either gonna just start adding planets to the list willy-nilly and have too many planets, or we come up with a more exclusive definition for planet before this gets out of hand. Remember, they had already been discovering a bunch of these smaller outer solar system objects, so Eris was really just the dwarf planet that broke the planet definition camel's back. I have such a way with words. So the community deliberates for a few years, and in 2006, when the IAU votes, they come out with the definition we talked about earlier. And as a result, Eris fails the bid for planethood and takes Pluto down with it. And the guy who discovered it is remembered as the man who killed Pluto. In regards to the actual IAU decision process, I'm really at a loss for what story to tell. On the one hand, if I go off documents and records, there's this very technical process of scientific argumentation. But if I'm honest and go off what I've heard on the Astro Grapevine, it sounds a lot more like a casual boozy gathering of a handful of overly enthusiastic astronomers who aren't really a good representation of the rest of the field. The most correct thing to say is probably that they're both true. But this tension with Pluto and Eris is honestly kind of just a blip on Mike Brown's CV. And if I may be so bold to suggest perhaps an origin story, like could you imagine you discover a planet and then report it to your field and your field changes the definition of the word planet on you? I imagine some of y'all have been watching this like, oh, poor Pluto, not a planet anymore. But like, Pluto doesn't have feelings. Oh, you you think you discovered a planet? No, no, we, we voted. Sorry. Enjoy your dwarf. And here's the absolutely wild part. This would not be the last time that Mike Brown discovered something that was initially announced to be a planet, only to have that discovery taken away from him. So Haumea is another dwarf planet like Pluto, and also like Pluto, it's had a pretty contentious life. Extremely long story short, it's kind of ambiguous who gets credit for discovering it. Basically, Mike Brown put out an announcement that he was going to give a talk about a new mysterious trans-Neptunian object that him and his team had discovered a while back. And just one week later, another team of astronomers from Spain announces that they've discovered an object that turns out to be the same thing, but because they actually announced and reported the discovery instead of just teasing it, they would get official discovery credit, which could have been a complete coincidence. But then somebody found some almost but not quite incriminating evidence. Apparently, someone from the Spanish team had accessed the online logs of Brown's observations that were referenced in the announcement he made two days after the announcement, and then five days later reported that object as their own. <laughs> it's pretty sus. Here's what Brown has to say about what went down. As a scientist, my job is to examine the evidence and come up with the most plausible story. It's impossible to disprove the story, claimed by the Spanish team. While looking through two-year-old data, they discovered Santa legitimately. Also, his team had nicknamed Haumea Santa because they discovered it around Christmas. It's, it's cute. They discovered Santa legitimately. And then, 
only hours later accessed information about where our telescope had been looking at and were shocked, shocked, to realize that the object they had just found was the same object that we had been tracking for months. Let's try a more plausible explanation. The Spanish team found our telescope pointings, used that information to infer the existence of Santa, and assumed that no one would ever know they had not found it legitimately. No way to prove it, but the latter hypothesis certainly sounds more plausible. So that quote is from this retrospective blog post that Brown wrote about the whole Hamea debacle that's honestly a really fascinating read. Like, a scientist's perspective of not only the professional aspects of this whole discovery drama, but also all the concurrent experiences in his life that were influencing and framing his work. Like the fact that he was planning on publishing months earlier and would have avoided this whole fiasco if not for the fact that his daughter was born a week earlier than expected, throwing off his timeline. Life happens, even for scientists, and it affects what they do. Definitely check out the whole thing if you want his full perspective. But the point is that from his perspective, Brown had clearly been scooped, and I pretty confidently agree with that. Scooping, by the way, is the word we use in academia for when somebody finds out about something you're working on and then publishes it before you. It's basically just stealing ideas, and unfortunately it happens a lot. And for this reason, people tend to keep a pretty tight lid on their data, which sucks because then you get all this hostility and data hoarding, and it's just not good for science. So it's kind of ironic that when Brown confronted the Spanish team about the log access, they told him that his habit of hiding objects was alienating and bad for science. The audacity. The guy who almost definitely scooped you being like, no, you're the one that's bad for science. Brown also complained to the IAU, and I guess they half agreed with him because they ended up not really naming a discoverer. They kind of split the difference, using Brown's proposed name of Halmea, but listing the discovery site as the observatory the Spanish team used. But they just left the discoverer field blank, and so everybody Everybody's mad. Brown because he was so obviously and publicly scooped. And the Spanish team because they did technically discover Haumea, at least as far as the official rules for planet discovery credit and the available evidence are concerned. And just to add insult to injury, they used Brown's name instead of their name, or at least a neutral third party name. From their perspective, they had played within the rules of the system, but the system still sided with the American from the mega prestigious institution rather than the astronomers from who knows what observatory in a country with substantially less representation in the IAU. A US conquest, as it was reported in one Spanish newspaper. And I definitely think there's something to that. A lot of scientists get scooped, and I don't think most of them end up getting international professional societies to side with them by denying their scooper credit. Most of the time, the person doing the scooping just gets credit. So while I empathize with Brown seeing publications that his name should have been a part of but wasn't, trust me, I've been there, I don't particularly like it. I think it's hard for me to sympathize with somebody who gets that feeling validated by the powers that be. Usually when I think of scooping in general, I think of somebody with a lot of power scooping somebody with relatively less power. The way I often see it is a professor scooping a grad student. But in this case, the person with the relative political power was the one scooped, so what, nobody gets credit? That's kind of messed up. So I do think that there's a case to be made for the Spanish team being wronged in the whole Haumea thing, but I will simultaneously grant that they probably did scoop Brown in front of the international astronomy community, and he was understandably upset. No, 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 no! I was horrified. My discovery had just been scooped by a group who decided not to wait to learn more. They didn't know any of the information about Santa that we did, in particular that it was definitely not the 10th planet. This was going to cause nothing but confusion. He was horrified, horrified, not just at being scooped, but at this team's lack of scientific integrity, that they announced the 10th planet preemptively without knowing enough about the object. I want you to keep that reaction in your pocket for this last discovery that we're gonna talk about. Or should I say discovery? So Eris was around 2003, Haumea was 2006-ish, and then 10 years later in 2016, Mike Brown and another Caltech astronomer publish a paper titled Evidence for a Distant Giant Planet in the Solar System where they present some data of a bunch of objects near the edge of the solar system clustering in a weird way that could theoretically be explained by a massive, never-before-seen planet 
further than Neptune and 5,000 times the mass of Pluto. We're not talking Planet 10 anymore, like Eris or Haumea might have been. We're not talking about like fake Planet 9, like Pluto. We're talking about the real Planet 9, the true Planet 9. And what an interesting coincidence it is that it's that same guy who keeps almost discovering the new planet. So I'm not gonna do a close reading of the paper here because we already had our science talk and the paper's fine. There's nothing particularly outrageous about the paper, just an interesting hypothesis really. I'm not the most well-versed in orbital dynamics, but the work seems pretty sound in that they present some data and explain how the data could theoretically be explained by a planet that we've never seen before. I want to put a little bit of emphasis on that could. I mean, in all fairness, this is how, for example, Neptune was discovered. The orbit of Uranus was off from whatever expected trajectory, so scientists inferred the presence of another planet that was gravitationally tugging on it and found Neptune. But here's the thing, if you claim to have evidence of a planet, and everybody starts looking for it, every year that passes without the planet being found is a strike against that hypothesis. And people have been looking, trust. I started grad school the year that paper came out and I remember how at the time the search for Planet Nine was a hot new thing, especially big data searches of it because big data was also the hot new thing. I literally know grad students whose entire PhDs were looking for Brown's Planet Nine. But it's been what, seven years of the field directing immense amounts of telescope and supercomputer time to this search and planets are kind of like Bigfoot in that way. If there are a bunch of people who want credit for discovering it and there's no evidence all these years later, even though people have been walking around with cameras in their pockets, maybe that first bit of evidence that made us start looking wasn't as solid as we thought. And in case you don't like my hand wavy anecdotal Sasquatch logic, there have been researchers who have gone back to the 2016 papers and redone the analysis and have found that the evidence for Planet Nine might actually just be a selection bias. So while I don't want to say that this Planet Nine definitely doesn't exist, that would be about as silly as trying to rationally argue the non-existence of a god, I can confidently confidently say that what they did was not discover a planet. They published a paper detailing an analysis that shows that some data they looked at is theoretically consistent with the possibility of a ninth planet, and that analysis has also been found to have some methodological flaws. At best, what they did is initiate a search for a hypothetical planet. That is not the same as discovering a planet. Which is why I was so surprised to find so many pop science articles that make it out to seem like Mike Brown did in fact discover Planet Nine. Case in point, a 2016 piece in Astronomy Magazine by Mike Brown titled, How We Discovered Planet Nine. I was initially thinking of doing a close comparison between the journal paper and the magazine article, trying to show the difference between the kind of careful, uncertainty aware hypothesis language of the paper with the certain decided confident tone of the article. But honestly, I think just looking at the title gets my point across, right? Not the hypothesis for Planet Nine, not how we might discover Planet Nine, not even an inquisitive, did we discover Planet Nine? How we discovered Planet Nine by Mike Brown. What was that thing he said in the blog post earlier about the uncurious and impatient scientists whose premature declaration of planet discoveries would only lead to confusion? In all fairness, this is not the first time a scientist has sensationalized their work and happened to accrue some acclaim in the process. I've certainly been accused of doing the same myself. And I'm sure there's something to say here about how pop science media outlets encourage that kind of sensationalizing, but that's a different video. For now, I'm interested in this differential between the amount of care that scientists give to uncertainty and unknown things when talking to other scientists and the sometimes patronizingly simple way they talk to the public. We are here for the vibes, not the rigor. Because that differential does something. In this case, it makes Mike Brown definitely look like the guy who discovered Planet Nine to most people who will learn about the idea of Planet Nine, regardless of whether he was intending to do that or not. To some extent, he makes it true for some people by just being a scientist and saying it. Scientifically, we do not have robust evidence for Planet Nine and there are sound arguments against the hypothesis. But if someone were to do a casual Google search about it, they could very well be led to believe that there is in fact a Planet Nine and Mike Brown discovered it. So just to recap, this one guy discovers a planet, they change the definition of planet on him. He discovers another one, somebody scoops him. He discovers yet another one late in his career with his big impactful paper, and it turns out that this planet very well may not exist. Would I say that Pluto 
was just the tragic but necessary victim of Mike Brown's career-long obsession with becoming the guy who discovered the newest addition to the solar system. It certainly would seem like I am, wouldn't it? But honestly, no, I'm not trying to say that's what happened. I'm not Mike Brown. I don't know what's in his heart. I just think it's interesting that the guy who had years ago dragged the Spanish team half credited with Halmea's discovery for being uncurious and acting preemptively rather than scientifically for the sake of credit, later announced the discovery of a thing which literally hadn't been discovered and in doing so positioned himself as the only American to ever discover a planet, a title he could only claim after removing Pluto from the picture. I don't want to pretend like I know the true motivations at play here, I obviously don't, but I've seen from my time in the field a lot of young, idealistic, excited astronomers get into their research and then quickly experience this very cutthroat environment of academic dishonesty and shady practices like scooping and the general publish or perish ethos that incentivizes everybody needing to discover the hot new thing. And in reaction to that, they either become disillusioned and leave the field or become that thing themselves. Is that what happens to the man who killed Pluto? Did he become that blob of lazy, uncurious, ego-driven science that he was probably wronged by earlier in his career? I don't know, I told you already, I don't know him. I'm just trying to use some data that I found to outline an interesting narrative that may or may not have anything to do with anything that's actually ever happened. So basically I'm doing what I was trained to do as an astrophysicist. <laughs> the selection bias in this story is probably just as bad as it was for the planet. Planet Nine paper. <laughs> but trying to tie this together, I hope from this trip down Mike Brown's planetary discography, we can learn that the decisions made in science, whether it's a definition or the crediting of a discoverer, or even whether or not an object is actually believed to exist, are all highly social and political processes. And I don't mean politics like the government killed Pluto or something, I mean that it's the product of power relations and arbitrary decisions made by humans rather than some hypothetical march towards an unadulterated scientific objectivity. Wouldn't it be funny if it was the other kind of political though, like Russia killed Pluto to get back at the Americans for going to the moon first? I'm joking, but they do have some pretty substantial representation on the IAU, so I don't know. New conspiracy, you heard it here first. Because <laughs> what the world needs is more space-related conspiracies. The scientific consensus of all of these things is subject to change, and we don't always have absolute static truths about them. It's certainly easy to get caught up in the feeling that we're definitely right about everything now, but the historic record would suggest that the cutting edge of knowledge is less absolute truth and more just the next thing to be disproven. So to wrap up all these silly astronomy hijinks, if this whole time Pluto was never specifically targeted for not being a planet, and the definition only changed to block this guy from becoming the guy who discovers a new planet, does that mean it's really a planet after all? No, sorry, it's still not a planet. Sure, there may have been some less than objective reasons for the redefinition, just as there are in any aspect of the scientific process, which I do still want to make the point of noting, just for clarity, is still valuable, still important, still worth doing, still often arbitrary. They're both true. It's just a silly arbitrary definition made up for silly arbitrary reasons. This is what science is. It kind of always has been. She's messy. I mean, as people doing the science, most things with people are messy. Were you hoping for me to somehow use this whole drama to validate your feelings that Pluto's still a planet actually? Because I'm not. Why would I do that? And more importantly, why would you want me to? It appears we're stuck in the visually metaphorical darkness this time around. So we talked about the science of Pluto, we talked planetary politics, but I still haven't addressed what, to me, feels like the dwarf planet in the room. Why do people care so much about Pluto being a planet? I have been asking this question for literal years. Back in the day, when I was still doing research about that dust cloud orbiting Pluto, friends, family, and random strangers I would meet would all have the exact same reaction to hearing about my work. Why isn't it a planet anymore? Tell me why. I demand for you to justify to me why it's not a planet. The scientists are wrong, it's a planet. They, they made a mistake. We should just change it back. We should just like undo it. I don't care what the scientists say. Pluto's still a planet to me, honey. 
<laughs> what does that even mean? Surprisingly, nobody really wanted to hear me talking about the dust. So when I, a baby astronomer who was literally studying Pluto, heard people who otherwise had no stake in astronomy making these wildly passionate claims as to what the true nature of a planet was, I can't help but try to dissect that a bit. So I am Confucian. Respectfully, why are people so invested? It's not like it's gone, it's still there, they didn't destroy it. There's not a team of planetary scientists on their way to your house right now to arrest you for not agreeing with their definition. Pluto as a planet is not some ancient significant thing that Western science killed off. It was discovered in the last century by a guy named Clyde. Clyde. Pluto as a planet is fully in the domain of white people science. So why do people feel that the astronomical taxonomy of a chunk of ice a billion miles away is a matter of what's in their hearts? America explain! Well, I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a scientist. I like to answer things. So I've come up with some hypotheses. But before I share those, go ahead and leave a comment about what you think about this whole Pluto is a planet debate. Why are we arguing about it? Who's right? Who's wrong? What does it matter? What do you think? I want to hear what people think without being biased by my unhinged opinions, which are incoming. So go ahead and do that right now. I'll wait. Okay, that's weird. Now that you've done that, here are my hypotheses. Hypothesis one is that people don't actually care that much and they're mostly joking, which to an extent is probably true. But that doesn't make for an interesting conversation and I'm not convinced that it's 100% a joke for most people. So we're gonna skip that one. Hypothesis two is the nationalism angle. Like I said before, Pluto was the only planet discovered by an American. So in losing Pluto as a planet, we're kind of losing our biggest contribution to the solar system. It's hard for me to evaluate this one because Unfortunately, I'm American, so I just don't have a good sense of what the rest of the world thinks about Pluto. But upon further consideration, I don't think that the majority of the people with whom I've had the Pluto's definitely still a planet to me conversation knew that Pluto was the only planet discovered by an American, so we're skipping that one too. Hypothesis three was more promising, nostalgia. At some point, I realized that everybody I heard the outrage from was a millennial or older, which means the youngest of them is old enough to have remembered learning about about Pluto being a planet in school before the 2006 demotion. Which means that for those people, Pluto being a planet was a part of their childhood that the reclassification effectively erased. So I collected more data. I went and asked my Gen Z friends what they think about Pluto. And theoretically, there are also a third population of people alive who remember a time before Pluto was discovered. But alas, I do not know any centenarians. If any of y'all are in the comments, pop off about your pre-Pluto discovery planet hood takes. But the Zoomers seem to be pretty uninterested in the conversation. It's just mundane. Pluto was never a planet to them. Why should they care? To be honest, they seemed a lot less interested in what astronomers had to say about Pluto and a lot more interested in what astrologers had to say about Pluto, at least in my circles. I'll grant that might be a bit biased. Coincidentally, Pluto's orbit is such that it spends 20 years in each of the zodiac constellations, which makes it like generation astrology. Like apparently millennials having our Pluto and Scorpio is why we're all broke, which I find hard to argue. <laughs> support my work on Patreon. Point is, nostalgia does appear to be a big part of the reason as to why some people have such strong feelings about Pluto, insofar that it's people who learned about it as kids who disagree with the fact that it's not a planet today. But I still want to dig deeper. Sure, it makes sense that it's that group of people who maintain that Pluto is not a planet, but why does learning something as a kid seem to preclude one from evolving their understanding of it as an adult? And relatedly, <laughs> Who benefits from that? So I poured over scholarly sources and perused peer-reviewed articles. <laughs> you know, I'm a researcher. I do very rigorous work. And I believe I found perhaps the most relevant text on the issue. The Pluto episode of Rick and Morty. Hey, listen! So for the unfamiliar, the show's about the zany and absurd sci-fi adventures of a crazy scientist anti-hero and his grandson. In one episode, the grandson has to make a model of the solar system for a school project, and his dad, Jerry, who's basically the show's punching bag and has this whole inferiority thing with his super genius father-in-law, decides he's gonna help. Jerry says, let's make Pluto. Morty says, Pluto's not a planet anymore. Jerry makes a passionate rebuttal, and the next thing you know, they've both been abducted by Plutonians, and the king of Pluto is asking Jerry to announce his discovery to the citizenry, and overnight, Jerry becomes a scientific sensation in the outer solar system. Now the easy read of this, of course, is to just make fun of Jerry. Look at how 
ignorant and insecure people who can't let go of the past are? Why can't they just be rational and accept the science? Tragic. See? It's easy. I made fun of someone. It was fun. I had a good time. I feel a little bit superior now. But that's kind of... It lacks depth, right? Like, it's easy to dunk on people for being wrong about science, especially if they get emotional about it. But I generally don't feel satisfied by explaining any social phenomena with, well, I guess some people are just stupid and lazy and I'm better than them. So rather than laugh at Jerry's fragile ego, I want to shift our attention to what I think is the much more interesting character study in this story. The citizens of Pluto. So basically what happened is that while Jerry's out there being the poster child for the Plutonian, we're definitely still a planet campaign, Morty learns that Pluto has been shrinking because of corporate plutonium mining, depleting the world of its very substance from the inside out for the king's profit. In the universe of the show, NASA had declared Pluto not a planet anymore because they literally saw it shrinking. In other words, the king uses Jerry as an authority figure along with the comforting but incorrect belief that Pluto's still a planet to keep his subjects from realizing that their world is being stolen out from underneath them. It is a literal corrupt plutocracy held up by fake science. Definitely doesn't remind me of anything in the real world. If I were to attempt projecting a message onto this episode, it would be something like blindly clinging to simple and perhaps comforting but ultimately inaccurate knowledge can make us more susceptible to being exploited. And that, I think, is the thing that's more interesting here than just Pluto is nostalgic. That our intuitive preference for static, straightforward, and reliable explanations for how the world works over the ambiguity and uncertainty and change inherent to reality can be something of a liability. Sure, I can imagine some evolutionary reason for humans having an aversion to the unknown. I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but I could certainly see it being some kind of survival instinct that at some point was useful. I'm sure there are people watching this who know a lot more about biology than me who can correct me in the comments. But in the 21st century, when our means of surviving are very different from they were earlier in human development, I would argue that comfort with uncertainty is kind of an important thing for critical thinking. And I know it doesn't matter for Pluto. There are no Plutonians being lied to and fracked under. No one really gets hurt by you believing Pluto's still a planet. Cultivating a healthy relationship with the ambiguity inherent in Pluto's nature probably isn't that valuable an endeavor. But as an educator and as an education researcher, I am both fascinated and deeply concerned when I hear people default to the logic of the world must be exactly what I learned it to be in middle school, regardless of the context. Because I have a hunch that Pluto is a planet is not the only thing we learned as kids that is probably far more complicated than we thought it was at the time, if not outright inaccurate. And I imagine that some of those wildly believed inaccuracies might actually have repercussions, not unlike those of our cartoon Plutonians. And I really hope it doesn't seem like I think everybody else are just brainwashed sheep who can't think as critically as I do, because this absolutely applies to me too. I must have written this last section of the video like, five or six times before realizing that there's not going to be a theoretically complete and perfectly prescriptive little bow to tie up this thesis about the dangers of avoiding uncertainty, I guess. I think the point I want to make is something about being okay with knowledge changing, but any conclusion I make that frames me as having the correct and final take about it is kind of missing the point, isn't it? Honestly, this was doomed for the start. I mean, who's right about Pluto? What was I thinking? How could I possibly answer that? My attempt to be the final authority about Pluto suffers the same hubris as my friends who insist that it's still a planet and the scientists who insist that they've found the newest planet. If not more, really. Like, it's one thing to just have an incorrect opinion, but it's a whole other thing to put that opinion on the internet thinking people want to hear it. Like, who do I think I am? But you're here watching me so I don't know, you tell me. So what do I do now? How do I wrap up this reach of a point about Pluto that's inexplicably transformed into a half-baked lecture about the epistemic value of uncertainty and how all of us, scientists and lay people alike, could benefit by releasing this stronghold on being right? I guess I could talk about my own professional experiences, you know, of being a scientist who's had to constantly update my understanding as the field progresses and learned to produce knowledge even when I can't answer every single question that 
that comes up and accept that I'll definitely be proven wrong in the future, but keep going anyways. I could even talk about my own personal experiences of how trying to maintain a modicum of uncertainty about people and things has counterintuitively given me a lot of clarity and confidence and comfort in many aspects of my life from my own mental health to relationships. But that's still centering my own perspective as being uniquely informative. So I think the move here is to defer to other people and let a complex range of perspectives tell a story that I couldn't on my own. One helpful perspective I might offer to kind of frame things is this really interesting paper that a lovely colleague of mine, Dr. Jen Radoff, wrote with some other science education researchers called Positioning is Not Understanding, The Value of Showing Uncertainty for Engaging in Science. The title's pretty self-explanatory. It's an analysis of students in a classroom activity that shows how the moments where students express uncertainty end up creating and maintaining bursts of scientific engagement for themselves and the peers they're working with. It turns out that students being able to say that they don't understand something is an important step in trying to understand that thing, which is kind of concerning when you think about how much seeming correct is valued in most educational contexts. It's a really fascinating study, and this skill that they're drawing attention to, this ability to admit when we don't understand something instead of trying to seem like we definitely have the right answer, I think that's the thing missing in people's Pluto takes. Planet truther, astronomer, YouTuber, or otherwise. Everyone seems to think they know the real truth, but no one wants to do the hard work of contending with their blind spots. So to close this video off while being as cognizant as possible of my own blind spots, I want to ask you, the viewers, what you think. I've had so many people with so many different kinds of expertise and experience leave comments on my videos about how whatever thing I'm talking about comes up in their field too, and then they tell me the their field version of it, which is always really interesting because it makes sense to me, but I wouldn't have known. So tell me, viewers, with your incomprehensible range of backgrounds and knowledge, what are the other Plutos? What are we telling ourselves has always been like this, but might actually be kind of like that? What are those things we learned in grade school that some people, even now that we're grown-ups who can access a wealth of knowledge instead of just the super simplified version we were taught because we were literally 12, can't seem to let go? And especially, are any of these other rhetorical Plutos hurting us? And this isn't just me fishing for hella comments for engagement today. I actually have a little experiment I want to try. People have been asking me to make a Discord since I started this channel, and I don't plan on doing that. First of all, because I don't know how to use Discord, and second of all, because I don't have the bandwidth to moderate an online community formed in my name. That is some smoke that at the present moment, I do not want. But y'all who keep asking me that realize there's a whole comment section here, right? Check out what people are saying. Inevitably, there will be a range, but some of it will be interesting, I guarantee you. And while while the prospect of responding to enough comments to actually facilitate a conversation overwhelms me like no other, I do want to use my videos to engage with viewers a bit. I already do post video essay Q&As on my Patreon, so if you want to ask me a question about my work or hear the answers I've given to other people's questions, go check that out. It's a fun time and also pays my bills. But it would be nice to have some kind of systematic, non-Patreon exclusive communication mechanism that didn't send me into a parasocial despair spiral. So here's what I'm trying out starting with this video. To initiate something approximating a conversation in the comments section, I'm gonna offer a prompt at the end of each video. So like I said today, what do you think about the whole Pluto debate? What do you think are other Plutos where we think one thing but maybe we should update our understanding? Do you think my entire take is a disaster? And then next time I make a video, I'll close it out by sharing and responding to some of the comments I get here. And it doesn't just have to be direct answers to the prompt that I'll share. I'll share whatever I find interesting. That will certainly be biased, of course, because I'm a person, but I'll try my best to represent some different perspectives. And hopefully this part's clear. In order to facilitate conversation between you all and not just conversation to me, I'm only going to share and respond to comments from people who have also commented on somebody else's comment. Does it show that I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get college students to participate in a discussion? This is me going full teacher mode. There must be some way to get y'all talking to each other. I mean that first video I made with all the dudes who were mad at me for talking about quantum mechanics and feminism in the same breath were coming back to my page like day after day for weeks to talk to each other. Like they had 50 comment deep threads of just the same couple people talking something out. I just need to figure out how to get that level of engagement without it being about how much I suck. Honestly, engagement's engagement. 
engagement. Say what you want. Please fight me. But yeah, I'm gonna start trying to end my videos not with conclusive truths, but with thought-provoking questions. And if you comment stuff, I'll talk about it, but only if you also talk to other people about it not just me. Because as I keep trying to remind myself, even though it's my name in the channel and my face on the screen, I don't have all the answers. I do not know who is right about Pluto. I'm sorry, I just don't. And if you feel cheated by the title of this video, you can leave a comment about how I'm just trying to be clickbaity before unsubscribing because I'm absolutely going to be making more videos about things that I don't have all the answers to. Things I may be very knowledgeable about, but still, I can't know everything. But hopefully by being transparent about my limited perspective and comfortable with the inevitability of me being wrong, I can at least be an example of a scientist trying to figure out how to practice humility in their work. Because if I've learned anything from all this drama about Pluto and the outer solar system, it's that science is kind of arbitrary. That doesn't mean it's not useful. That also doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. But we should understand that whatever it is we think we know will never be the full or final truth. And embracing that doesn't make you a bad scientist. If anything, it gives you a better relationship to the knowledge creation process. Because as powerful as knowledge is, it's gonna change. Just like I'm gonna change, just like you're gonna change, and just like Pluto's gonna change. So for the love of Hades and all the underworld beings we associate with him, let Pluto change. Hello, welcome to the end of my video. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a fun and light return to the channel. I just came back from something of a break from making videos after my first like season or whatever you want to call it. And I am back with better production and more ideas and a sense of direction. And I'm really excited to see where we go in this year. The only reason I can afford to continue making videos like this is the wonderful and generous patrons whose names should be going across the screen right now. If you're able to pledge even $3 a month, it would mean a lot to me. I'm really trying to see if I can kind of ramp up this YouTube stuff in the next year, but I'll only be able to do that if a little bit more of my income can come from it because we gotta live and pay bills and all that trash. So yes, thank you to the Patreons already. Sometimes I put some extra stuff up there that isn't published on the main channel, so you can check that out at the link in the description. And if Patreon doesn't feel right for you, but you still wanna support my work, like the video, leave a comment, leave a few comments, send the video to somebody, subscribe and hit the bell. All of those algorithmic things I know seem very silly, but they are one-to-one -one the determinant of my bottom line and ability to continue making stuff. So do the little algorithm things and I really appreciate it. In the spirit of what I was just saying about wanting to start sharing comments at the ends of each of my videos, I'm gonna start doing that today. So the comments I'm gonna share today is from the introduction to me and the channel video I had made where I mentioned Pluto that spurred the conversation that resulted in me making this video. So on that video, Senshidayo said, I love hearing this because it resonates with my own educational curiosities and challenges in academia. This is also a very good channel intro. Thanks. Lastly, yes, Pluto is a planet. We could create a typology where Earth is a dwarf planet because Jupiter is much larger and more massive or because it's rocky and not primarily gas or ice. Uh, typologies have no impact on what a thing is, but do alter how we discuss and interpret their qualia. Pluto is an approximately spherical planetary body orbiting the sun, hence a planet. So the zeroth order response to this is referring to part one of the video where we talked about the official criteria of planet. So this person does get spherical and orbiting the sun, but uh, misses the clearing out your orbit thing, which they do correctly point out is arbitrary. This whole definition is arbitrary. I said that a bunch, right? Like they could have defined it this way. They could have defined it that way. It's just a typology. And I agree with you 100%. You are absolutely right. To whatever extent, you know, I can say somebody is right. However, I'm curious, Senshidayo, you responded to somebody else's comment where they say they need a video on why Pluto's better off being not a planet. Uh, and Senshidayo responds, all we need to do is fight until we convince the next group of astronomers and astrophysicists to change its status back to planet. LOL. I also kind of agree with you here, because you could, like, it, it could. There's no reason that it's set in stone. Like, there's no law or rule that says once we define something one way, we can't go back 
to what we thought before. I can't think of any examples like that off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are things in science that have been like that where we've like reneged on a decision. But the question I'm actually thinking about when I read this is being that you've so aptly explained why the typology is arbitrary and doesn't mean anything and just serves like this utilitarian purpose why is it a valuable thing to petition for it to be changed back because if it doesn't matter it shouldn't matter either way i agree that the, it's arbitrary but like i don't know I, I i feel like there's something missing and i'm very curious to hear why you think uh if, if maybe you're just joking but if you if you really feel like this should be like the thing the next generation of astronomers is tasked with not to say it couldn't happen but why do you think it should happen why do you want it to happen what what would that bring about what would that mean for you yeah so i hope you hear this and respond and i look forward to reading what you have to say and also what everybody else has to say and i believe that's that on that Get out of my house.